so you too could have foot-shaped ice cream from your favorite novel, which is not a phrase that I ever thought I was going to say, nor followed up with the fact that this novel is arguably one of the most impactful novels of its era. In 2023, it was Barbie feet that were all over the media, but in 1894, it was Trilby feet. The novel Trilby was so popular that not only did it leave a lasting effect on literature and publishing, but on the idea of fandoms, fashion, and feet. In fact, we can credit it with everything from the popularization of pedicures to potentially the invention of celebrity feet pics. George du Maurier, who wrote Trilby, was an artist for Punch magazine, and in 1894 he sold the story to Harper's Monthly, who was planning on putting it out in parts every month in their magazine. Eventually they would turn it into a published book. What they didn't expect though was just how successful this story would become. It had a strange and fantastical plot with fads like hypnotism and just a generally bohemian style with a bit of a horror edge. It was everything that audiences were looking for at the time and it absolutely gripped them. Interestingly enough, there are some differences between the serial and the book in the fact that they actually removed the more uh, racy sections for the serial that was published in the magazine, but they added those back into the book. They did, however, remove a secondary character from the entire story after Whistler, yes, that Whistler, completely and actually took them to court over the fact that one of the characters not only resembled him in description, but also in the drawings that they had printed. So he had a fair argument and they removed the entire character, thankfully not a very important one, from the book version. But again, they put the racy parts back in, so I think it kind of came out even. And in the end, that lawsuit actually benefited them because it was news like that which helped them gain notoriety. So that way, when the story made its way from the UK over to the US, general populace already knew about it, even if they hadn't read it. And so the book debuted with immense popularity in America. So what is this story that was so absolutely popular that we've somehow kind of forgotten. Well, it turns out that the story of Trilby not only came out in novel form, but came out in many movies over the years. We just switched up the name. You might be a little bit more familiar with it under the name of Svengali. The last few movies that were made using the general plot came out under that name, which is the name of the main villain character. And yes, that is where the trope of the character also originates. The most recent of which was from 1983, starring Peter O'Toole and Jodie Foster. It was a modernized version of the story. Story, however, the original story takes place in the 1850s and centers around three bohemian artists from the UK, two English, one Scottish, who landed themselves in Paris and are working in their own little studio together, in particular the youngest of which, Little Billy. As we get to know these characters in walks Svengali and his we're just gonna say minion, Gecko. Svengali and Gecko are both musicians, and the description of Svengali, as well as many subsequent discussions about him and other people within the book, belie the fact that he is an incredibly anti-Semitic character, and that thread is carried the whole way through in numerous other ways. So this is unfortunately very much a novel of its time in that regard. But just as we get to know those characters, we get introduced to Trilby, who is of course the romantic female lead of the story. She walks in after hearing Svengali's music across the building, and she is an artist model for one of the other studios in the space. And she walks in wearing nothing but a petticoat, a military overcoat that she likely picked up from the props section on her way out the door, and a pair of men's slippers. And in general, she's a very starkly beautiful and notable character. She is unusually tall for a woman and has very short bobbed hair. So everyone takes note of her when she first arrives in the room. They note her beauty and her presence. And in general, the character is written is sort of a balance between very unrefined and very ladylike attributes. And as she's introduced to all of the other artists in the room, they ask her what she does she knows that she is an artist model, works en l'ensemble, as she puts it, where she models head, hands, and feet. At which point she notes that her foot is the most beautiful in Paris, pulls it out, and says that the only foot that remotely compares to it is her right foot. She shows her feet to the room of artists who are all absolutely entranced by not only her beauty, but 
her feet as well. Quite frankly, the author does too. <laughs> he describes them as a true inspiration of shape and color, all made up of delicate lengths and subtly modulated curves, and noble straightness and happy little dimpled arrangements in innocent young pink and white. Definitely poetic. And the character of Little Billy, the youngest of the three artists, feels that way as well, and as soon as she leaves, he goes and makes a sketch of her left foot. The only really notable fault that Trilby seems to have is the fact that she cannot sing, as they discover when Svengali is playing his music and Trilby attempts to sing along but cannot carry a tune. Everyone in general falls in love with her, little Billy the most so, and eventually he ends up asking her to marry him numerous times, and in the end she says yes. However, his mother is not okay with this and manages to scare Trilby away, who feels like she was never really worthy of little Billy to begin with because of her less than noble lineage. Trilby disappears for a while, all of the artists return to their homes and continue their lives over the years. Little Billy falls into absolute despair for a while, has a bunch of health problems, and eventually five years later, they end up back in Paris, go to a show together, only to find that the singer who's being debuted in Paris that night is none other than Trilby being conducted by Svengali. Suddenly, she is able to sing so beautifully that the entire room is in tears, and everyone is totally enraptured with not only her voice, but her left foot, which she places bare onto a little stool while she is performing. After the performance, the artists attempt to go see her, but she snubs them quite rudely, which is definitely not in her character, and they leave quite confused. They run into her performing again in London, but this time everything goes wrong and she is unable to sing, and is very confused as to where she is, what's going on, has no memory of any of the performances. At this point, it's found out that Svengali has died. In the case of Trilby, however, she is left languishing with her health, getting worse and worse and worse. She doesn't remember almost anything from the last few years, just absolute confusion, doesn't remember how to sing at all. After quite a long period of bad health, Trilby accidentally sees a picture of Svengali, falls into essentially a trance again, sings beautifully, and then dies very tragically. Little Billy, absolutely distraught, also dies not too long after that. We only get a conclusion to the story when one of the other artists makes his way down to Paris, meets up with Gekko, and finds out that Svengali had been hypnotizing Trilby the whole way through, and that's the only reason she was able to sing. However, every time he hypnotized her in order to get her to perform and do what he wanted her to do, she reduced in health and spirit. So eventually she was just too drained and could no longer survive. Of course, this creates an absolutely dramatic and romantic horror horror story that was very much perfect for the era, and created what they called the Trilby Craze. They named all of the subsequent objects that were produced out of the fandom for this Trilbyana, and those that were huge fans of the story called themselves Trilbyites. It reached a point where someone actually named a town after Trilby in Florida. So it's still there today, in between Tampa and Orlando, though it seems that all of the roads which had originally been named after the characters have been renamed at some point. The story also found its way to the live stage. The Greatest Show on Earth had a Trilby story added in where one of the performers on horseback played as the character of Trilby and the ringleader played as Svengali. Plenty of other satirical works in the form of plays and burlesque and other books. In one story they renamed Svengali Spaghetti and gave him such strong powers of hypnotism that he could actually move inanimate objects. In the novel Bill Tree, they changed Trilby to be a man with particularly long feet, and the now female villain taught him how to play an accordion with his feet while standing on his head. And not surprisingly, plays that actually took the story more seriously also opened up, some sanctioned and some not, all over the US. But as the play found its way to larger stages, the question became, who was going to play Trilby? She was such an iconic looking woman, and her feet apparently were the most important part. They not only needed to find an actress who could sing beautifully and bring everyone to tears, but also had Trilby's feet. And suddenly it was all over the newspapers figuring out who was going to play this part, whose feet were going to be beautiful enough. And they started putting pictures of actresses' feet in the newspapers. So in many ways, this is the origin of the celebrity feet pickup today. And uh, it's about to get so much worse. In New York City, it was Miss Virginia Harned who became the Trilby uh, to really be the first on stage. Over in the UK, it was Miss Dorothea Bard who took up the role. Both of these actresses did do plenty of other works. Trilby just seems to be the highlight of both of their careers. They went on stage in this 
absolutely iconic costume as she first appears in the military coat and everything, and one of the popular additional pieces to the entire ensemble was a short-brimmed little hat, which today we call a trilby hat, named in honor of trilby, because that's where it was broadly popularized. There are actually quite a few art galleries that put up exhibits of some of the original prints from the book, and people flooded these art galleries to the point where they were having to turn away patrons and having them come back another time because they were too packed full. So any sort of art related to Trilby in real life apparently garnered the same interest that it did in the book. Interestingly enough, in the novel, that happens quite a few times, both as plaster casts are made of Trilby's feet and are sold as she becomes a famous singer. Her foot sketch that was done by Little Billy and left in the studio is actually put into a glass case, and the artists find that when they return, so they weren't the ones that did it. Someone else found this drawing of a foot, thought it was so absolutely lovely it needed to be basically kept behind glass, and someone else actually drew a giant version of Trilby's foot on a wall, and one of the characters tries to purchase the entire wall to have it completely removed from the building and taken back to the UK with them. That ends up not working out, apparently, but that just shows you how deeply ingrained the obsession with Trilby's feet was within the story, let alone outside of it in the real world. Most notable was all the foot-themed merchandise that came out, because Trilby's feet were featured so heavily and so poetically in the novel, people started picking up on the idea of selling Trilby's feet. Now, of course, this was not a controlled thing, so people across the country and even over in the UK started selling anything under the Trilby name that they possibly could. Some things make a little bit more sense, things like shoe polish. Okay, that's at least adjacent to feet. We also have things like bias velveteen skirt bindings. All right, near enough to feet. There were also Trilby shoes that were sold by Montgomery Ward in Chicago. So we've broadened this out to really anything foot adjacent at this point, but they kept going. In fact, you could have a Trilby foot shaped scarf pin or other types of fancy jewelry items in the shape of a foot. You could also get collectible spoons with little engravings of Trilby's foot and different names of the characters. You Definitely need to go try and collect all of those. I also came across smoking pipes, or even a toothpick holder shaped like Trilby's foot. But the best of all that I found images and descriptions of and proof that it existed and was popular enough to be sold quite a few people was that of Trilby foot ice cream molds. So you too could have foot-shaped ice cream from your favorite novel, which is not a phrase that I ever thought I was going to say, nor followed up with the fact that this novel is arguably one of the most impactful novels of its era. There are so many modern articles that have been written about Trilby and the influence that it had on literature of the era, on our culture, on our popularity of different things. It's just absolutely everywhere, and that's actually how I first came across it. I was trying to look up the history of pedicures. And lo and behold, I found out that pedicures weren't terribly popular in the US until Trilby. This is notable because Trilby's feet weren't prized because they were tiny. They were actually a fairly normal, if not a little bit large size, but they were perfectly beautiful. They were unmarred, they were well proportioned and well taken care of. So in order to achieve the Trilby foot, you too just need to have the right foot care, which starts simply with wearing the right shoes. Trilby wore a pair of oversized men's slippers so as not to end up with any corns or bunions, but they recommended that simply you just wore shoes that were not too tight, you avoided really high heels or really pointed toes, which is a little bit difficult in 1894 and 1895, considering that the trend for shoe styles at that point was an incredibly long pointed toe. Granted, the heels were on the lower side, and interestingly enough, the pointed toe did disappear right around 1896-97, and I am starting to wonder if Trilby might not have something to do with that. So that is some future research that I, as a shoe historian, need to keep doing, but they continue to take it a step further than just wearing the right shoes. The newspapers also recommended that you did a lot of everyday foot care. You used a pumice stone or a file to smooth it out, trim your nails weekly. If you can get in to get a pedicure, you should go do that. Numerous magazines of the time mentioned that the pedicure popularity is because of Trilby, and that 
There were pedicures around before that in the US, but they weren't terribly popular. They had come over from France and they were pretty spotty. Manicures were much more popular simply because hands were visible all the time, whereas feet, not so much. Women were wearing stockings along with shoes or boots. They were going to have things covered up because walking around barefoot was just kind of weird to do in that era. But Trilby meant that there was suddenly a barefoot craze. And even if women weren't going to suddenly be walking around barefoot, they too wanted to have Trilby feet. And so they started going in to get proper pedicures done on their feet. Now at this time, pedicures were usually somewhat related to what they call a surgeon chiropodist. So essentially a podiatrist of today, it was all sort of mixed in with the medical field simply because not only were you going to a pedicure to have say your nails done and your foot bathed, but also to deal with poultices and removal of corns and any sort of issues that you had with your feet from a health aspect. So this suddenly turned feet into not just a major discussion point with foot health, but with foot beauty. And that was a long-standing tradition within the 19th century. Feet were a bit romanticized in that era, and they carried with them not only the weight of moral implications that someone who is good and beautiful will have good and beautiful feet, and someone who is not will have ugly feet, but also that feet were a sign of essentially good breeding. So I'm gonna have to pull eugenics into this for just a really quick moment, in particular in the case of Trilby, just because she was noted as not coming from a good background necessarily, a bit of a mix of things. Some of her family was a little bit higher born, a lot of it wasn't, but because her feet were so beautiful, they talk about them as if it's a sign of her good breeding. So there is definitely a history to a uh, foot obsession when it comes to the 19th century, but it really seems to have reached a peak when it comes to Trilby and she just includes all of the aspects all in one. And Trilby herself as a character was immensely popular. I found one example of a woman in the US who actually took up cosplaying Trilby pretty much full time, 100% in character. There were shops that offered the ability to do plaster casts of hands and feet. And that mentioned that there was an uptick in women coming in and having plaster casts of their feet done, just like Trilby had had done. Though they do mention it's not too terribly common and more often they were selling plaster casts of women's feet that were imported from Europe. So actually a bit closer to the book in a way. And just in case the average woman did feel like she had the appropriate Trilby feet, in 1895, a Pittsburgh newspaper advertised a competition for women, asking them to send in tracings and measurements of their feet. And there would be a committee voting on who has the most perfect Trilby feet. And they would win a custom pair of shoes. The peak that was the Trilby craze started to edge off in 1896 when Du Maurier, the author, passed away very suddenly. So that put an end to a lot of the discussions about his life, how he came up with the story, whether he was going to write the next book, whatever it was, and the craze slowed down pretty quickly. It did not, however, completely disappear, nor did the interest in feet. In fact, in many ways, this had introduced a much broader population to the idea of foot fetish, because that very much is what this book is. And it never really faded out completely from there. There's a definite uptick in foot fetish material around that turn of the century point, and you can definitely see a lot more of it publicly as well. I found this lovely series of articles from 1907 where they were talking about famous feet and have pictures of all sorts of actresses and models' feet, everything from Virginia Harned to Isadora Duncan and even Sarah Bernhardt are included in these pictures. And this Chicago newspaper also started up their own competition looking for perfect feet. This time they specifically mentioned them as Cinderella feet, which they were looking for a particular size, or Recamier feet based on of this portrait of Juliette Recamier with her bare feet that is particularly famous, and they wanted to find a pair of feet that looked like hers. So you could win either one of the competitions and win slightly different slippers of gold. And stories like this continued. You can find discussions of actresses' feet throughout the rest of the 20th century. Obviously, we know where it's ended up today with the idea of celebrity feet pick websites, as well as much broader discussions of foot fetishism and the constant joke of don't give away your feet for free on the internet. So in reality, Trilby was a pretty big turning point in the discussion about feet, specifically when it comes to bare feet and foot fetishes. Of course, the barefoot trend would eventually take hold as we move further into the 20th century. Sandals become popular in the 1920s and things like flip-flops in the mid-century take off as well. Women no longer wearing stockings, but instead wearing hose and then eventually nothing with their shoes. So bare feet abound as we continue past the era of Trilby, but in many ways it really was the first time people were introduced to this 
it popularized pedicures, and it really brought about a whole new obsession with feet that I did not realize that they had in the 19th century. I was going to be able to find foot-themed merchandise from that era. In general, this is one of the early examples of merchandise of a fandom and fan fiction and all of those things as well, so I just thought I'd drag you down this very interesting rabbit hole with me so that way you too would know the impact of Trilby.